Good evening. Uh, welcome to the 6 p.m. press conference for the CZU Lightning Complex. My name is Jonathan Cox, Deputy Chief for CAL FIRE here in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. Uh, as always, just make sure we uh, take our conversations outside, mute our telephones, uh, and for all the media to remain masked with COVID masks at all times. Uh, just a quick incident update on this fire. Uh, we currently have uh, 50, we can confirm 57,000 acres uh, have burned on this fire, uh, and we have 2% containment now. Uh, 24,000 uh, structures remain threatened uh, out in front of the fire, uh, and we, have, we can confirm 97 structures have been destroyed. Uh, just so, so uh, everyone's clear on what that means, in the last two days we've had two damage inspection teams out in the field. Starting tomorrow we're going to have five damage inspection teams, so we, we anticipate those numbers to climb uh, in the next few days. Uh, we still have uh, two firefighter injuries from uh, the beginning of this incident. Uh, their status remains unchanged. Uh, minor injuries not hospitalized. Uh, and our final personnel count for today is we have 1,157 personnel assigned to this incident. With that, I'll hand it over to Incident Management Team 3, Operations Section Chief, Chief Brunton. Uh, good evening. So throughout the day, uh, we've seen uh, a little bit of uh, help from Mother Nature as far as a uh, little bit cooling temperatures, a little change in the wind. Uh, we have not seen erratic fire behavior throughout the day. It's allowed us to uh, make some progress, uh, albeit uh, somewhat small due to our lack of resources. But uh, we have seen little progress as far as being able to start to construct some contingency lines, uh, especially in the southern end of the fire. That's in progress as we speak, so it's giving us a good opportunity to get in there and take care of that. We still are doing a lot of point protection on uh, structures throughout the entire fire, um, which has allowed us, because of the intensity has dropped slightly, um, for the crews to get in there and, and get some good work done. Uh, fire is still making progress uh, in, in burning down uh, throughout the San Lorenzo Valley into the Highway 9 corridor. Um, and on the western end of the fire and the north end of the fire, uh, the fire is uh, being mitigated slightly by the onshore marine flow, the, the, the fog layers and so forth. So that's allowing us to get in there uh, where we can do some work, especially behind the community of Davenport to provide a layer of protection for, for that community. Uh, we're looking to see what's going to happen tonight. The weather should be more favorable. We should not have as heavy of the north winds that we've been experiencing. So uh, our expectation is that the fire behavior should mitigate slightly, only slightly. Uh, but we will continue to make progress where we can, take advantage of those opportunities where we can, and, uh, and make some progress. Uh, with the coming weather the next few days, we can, we can do some pretty good work. Beyond that, it's going to provide us some challenges, uh, and we're preparing to meet those challenges with the weather uh, as the coming days uh, approach. Uh, speaking next from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office is Deputy Chief Clark. Well, good evening. So I thought I'd touch on a little bit about what we did today. Uh, we completed the evacuations of the city of Scotts Valley, about 12,000 residents. We completed that about mid-afternoon. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is, is really reiterating, and we, we've said this uh, uh, at prior press conferences, please do not return back into the evacuated zone if you don't have to. It, provide, it presents hazards for everybody that's trying to work in that area. Like I can totally understand if you have medication, if you, if, if you feel like you have to go back, but please try to seek alternative means to obtain that stuff. Uh, contact your doctor. Uh, if, there, if there's an alternate route you can go to obtaining critical things that you need, that would be extremely helpful just based on the dynamic and changing nature of the fire and really allowing fire personnel to, to devote everything they can to helping put out this fire. Um, in terms of uh, burglary suppression, so today we had about 60 personnel Looking, looking for potential looters and protecting property. I, I can say that, uh, that uh, there are people out there, unfortunately, that are, that are looking uh, to victimize people who have left and have been displaced. And it's absolutely, it's, it's terrible and it's disgusting. Uh, today alone, we arrested five people. Five people with two car loads full of stolen property off of Fall Creek Road. And so there's more information on that. Our press information officer is, uh, is posted information about those folks. On our Facebook page, and so you can go to uh, you know our the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office Facebook uh, page to obtain more information with with regards to those arrests. But in touching on that, some of us have ring cameras, webcams, and that sort of thing around your, around our houses. If you see uh, like somebody prowling around your house, call call our dispatch center at 
1121 831-471-1121 and report report the prowling. We'll get an officer there. Uh, like I said, today we had 60 personnel. We're going to continue with likely that strength of people uh, it, it, for as long as, as, as people are displaced. So we're going to have people in the area uh, looking for these folks. But if you, if you see something, please call. Uh, in terms of large animal rescue, uh, I wanted to provide some information as far as that was concerned. If there are, if you have large animals that need to be evacuated, I'm going to provide you a number. And this is to our large animal rescue uh, um, folks that will that'll help get those animals out. That phone number is 831 331 831-331-6227. That's for large animal evacuation. Uh, I want to touch on missing persons. So uh, th this has kind of come up, and it's obviously something that we, that we encourage. If you can't find your, if you haven't heard from your loved one, please call us. Uh, and like I said yesterday, uh, you can go to the Red Cross uh, website to, to look to see whether or not uh, they've been reported there. Uh, if you can't find them there, call our dispatch and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look into it. Uh, to provide you some numbers, we've, we've taken about 19 missing persons cases since this fire started, 19. Uh, we've, we, uh, we have detectives that have looked into it. We brought that number down to two. So there are two missing persons cases at this point that we're actively trying to confirm. And so we're gonna continue that until there's a resolution to both of those. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanna to touch on, there was another uh, uh, evacuation center that was opened at Simpkins uh, Swim Center. So that's, that's open today, you can go there. Uh, if you've been displaced, you need a place to go. But also I'd, I'd encourage you to contact uh, the, uh, the shelter hotline at 866-272-2237 to be uh, connected with uh, shelter services. Thank you. Speaking next from the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office is Detective Blanksway. Good evening. Right now, we too are in safety and security mode. We have teams of people, including law enforcement and volunteers who are in the area, providing those um, safety and security measures for the northern part of this fire, the areas that reach into San Mateo County. We want to say thank you to everybody who has evacuated so far and those that are doing so right now. We're still seeing a lot of people who are entering the area for whatever reason, and we wanna reiterate that these are hard closures. We have law enforcement personnel who are staffed at these closures, and we're not allowing anybody back in for safety and security reasons. We stress this because we wanna make sure that you're not putting any of our first responders in a situation where they have to risk their lives to rescue you. I know that everybody wants updates as far as what's going on at their house and what's going on at their neighbor's street and, and their friend's property. We can't give you those numbers right now. Right now we're trying to assess the needs of the community and it's a really great opportunity for us to show our strength as a community. By listening to our fire experts and cooperating with these orders and showing that you can be patient and wait for this information, as many of the other fire experts have said, this is going to be a long haul. And we're we, we would like your patience in that. So thank you very much. And um, again, your cooperation and patience is much appreciated. Speaking next, uh, one of the Unified Incident Commanders uh, from CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, Chief C. Hey, good evening. Uh, this morning I talked about trying to obtain some small wins. Obviously we did today. We've got 2% containment on, on this fire. I know it's not much, but it's a small win. Lots of small wins equal a big win at the end of the day. Today was a good day for us. Uh, we've had smoke conditions that have kept the fire in check with increased humidities and reduced winds. Uh, we'll see what comes overnight. Uh, tonight, we're anticipating at the upper elevations that the humidity will drop again at, on the high ridge tops, but down in the lower levels, the humidities will stay increased, so it will moderate the fire behavior in those areas. With that said, the firefighters are, have been working extremely hard for many, many hours over the last several days, and they're going to continue to do so. This camp's increased in size by 100 personnel today, and a few resources have come in. Over the course of the next week or so, we're going to continue to see that small trickle effect coming in as we see out-of-state resources deployed here in California to assist us. 
Right now, we've got 13 incident management teams deployed on two dozen different large fires in the state of California. This emergency system is strapped, but please be aware, everyone's doing the best they can for the citizens of California. Thank you. And our final speaker, uh, the unit chief for CAL FIRE in the local San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, Chief Larkin. So we're entering into day six uh, of this incident. And uh, as we keep saying, this is gonna be a long haul. Our firefighters are out there doing the absolute best they can with the limited resources that we have to protect the citizens of Santa Cruz County and San Mateo County. Um, as we reiterate each time, there are still a lot of citizens that have chosen to stay in the community. And I had firsthand uh, eyewitness to a lot of those people driving around the uh, fire area uh, when I went out to do just a little bit of a, a windshield surveying of myself of the, the devastation that is occurring. And uh, it's very difficult to maneuver around this fire as it is with the narrow roads and to add that public back in there uh, is very, uh, very difficult and very unsafe for our firefighters. So if you're in the area um, and you don't need to be there, please leave, let us do our job so that it's the safest environment we can provide for our firefighters. <clears throat> this is gonna be the long haul as we keep saying. We're day six into this fire and we've only got it 6% contained. So. Uh, bear with us. We're doing the best we can with the resources we have, and as resources come in, the team's going to allocate those resources uh, equally uh, to the assignments that need to be completed. So, thank you. All right, as usual, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, I just ask that we group them together tonight, uh, just so we don't have to shuffle too much. So, uh, uh, whoever we want to start with. Just a quick question. Uh, okay. Do you check to have the face and influx of tourists? It's still hot out. People still come to the beach. Obviously, we know the water's bad. Sure. Yeah, speaking to tourism, uh, you know, the county's advocated uh, that, that, that please, if, if you don't live here, please don't come here to, to, to recreate. Uh, we've displaced a lot of people from the San Lorenzo Valley. Those people need places to stay. And so there's only so much of that. And so by increasing tourism into the county, it only, it only takes away rooms for folks that really need them. So again, you know, we would encourage you, please, if you do not live here, uh, don't come here to recreate. We, we, we'd love to see you on a different day, just not now. Any additional questions? John Paul and Terry with KON and KYT. Just came from a group of people from Bonnie Lane. We're rallying at a checkpoint there. We have signs out there, very upset about what happened up in their community. Can someone characterize the resources there or give them some answers that they're asking for about how the attack is gone and what the plan is up there in the future. Sure, so the question is really about the operations that are going on in the Bonnie Dune area. So as you can imagine, the Bonnie Dune area has been hit very hard uh, by the fire. Um, and as uh, first responders, our uh, <clears throat> hearts go out to those folks. Uh, that is very devastating what they've experienced, whether their house has been destroyed or their house, they're out of their homes now. I can, I can sympathize with that. Unfortunately, as I've said before, we have uh, very few resources. So typically in an area that size, we would have probably 10, 20 times the resources to combat that fire. We simply don't have it. It's just the resources are only finite. As you heard Chief C uh, say already before, the number of fires throughout the state, uh, we're really tapped out. We're bringing in stuff from out of state. That, that should indicate that how, how far drawn down we are with resources. So we do the best what we, we can. Um, we have to change our strategy, we have to change our tactics uh, to uh, address a fire situation like this. As we said before, it's unprecedented. Um, this isn't just a, a typical fire that we face day in and day out. This is unprecedented, this is historic. So take that into mind with the limited resources and doing the best we can. Um, we can only have, like we keep saying, small wins and, and we, we do point protection. So it's life, number one, uh, and we've been taking care of that by evacuating the, the people so that their life safety is the number one priority. Then we move on to the property conservation, property protection we're doing, uh, but with the magnitude of this fire and, and the fuels and all those things, we can only do so much with what we've got. So um, I know it's, it seems easy to ask for patience in this. We are doing the absolute best we can. We've had firefighters that work double, triple shifts. Um, so we're maximizing our personnel out, but there's only so much that they can give 
before they become unsafe. And we cannot let them be unsafe because then they are ineffective and it becomes a, a downward spiral at that point. So um, all, all we can ask is, I, I know it's hard to ask for patients in this, but we are doing absolutely everything we possibly can. And I also want to stress to you that they wanted to convey that great respect for all of you. This wasn't calling you out you know, in a hard way. They just had a lot of emotions and they wanted to convey that to you as well. Oh, certainly. I mean, this is an emotional event. Um, you know, lives are on the line, the property, uh, everything that they've worked for, hard for. Um, we can appreciate that. We're all, we've all, you know, been there in that situation one way or the other. Uh, so we are just, the message is, we are doing everything we possibly can and we're trying to mitigate that situation. And as soon as we can, they'll be getting back to their homes and hopefully back to their normal lives. Stephen Baxter, Sanford Local. Could you talk about the threat of evacuation for City of Santa Cruz and the threat of fire for UC Santa Cruz? Okay, so for right now, um, we, we don't uh, feel that there's a, a direct threat uh, to either the campus nor to that community. We are putting in at this point in time, uh, started last night and in throughout the day, um, a good contingency line. So we have a good plan that we're, we're having success with. The weather has mitigated to such that we can have success with that. We have some resources we can put into play. And so we are working extremely hard to put in a, a contingency line that will uh, protect those communities. Um, so, uh, at this point in time, and the way the weather's mitigating, uh, it's, it's a, it, they're probably the more safer of the communities. Uh, if they weren't, we would have already done the evacuations, been very aggressive with our evacuations for, for the right purpose because of the lack of resources and because of the fast moving fire. So, uh, the fact that they're not uh, evacuated at this point, or we have not required their evacuation, is, is a good indicator as to their safety and the safety of their community. Could you tell me, please, on the Ethan Barrett's emergency use? The Santa Cruz, a lot of people there think that the place can never burn. Um, is, is that, I mean, because you know, there is not a lot of vegetation that's connecting various places. It seems like it's not one of the most communities in that way. Is, is, could, a, could a town like Santa Cruz catch fire from a fire like this? You know, it, it, I hate to say it, this is California. And, and anything's possible, in particular with wildfires. I mean, we've seen time and again over the past number of years, communities that uh, we said, hey, we'll never burn, or never historically have burned, and we've seen, unfortunately, that they have, or they've been affected directly by the fire. So I would never let your guard down with that. I think it's, it's a relatively safe community, uh, but again, most communities in California are surrounded or nearby to uh, wildland areas. And with the extreme conditions we're seeing, um, you know, as prepared as we are as fire service professionals, we do become surprised as to these conditions. I mean, we, who would have ever expected a fire of this magnitude in this area? It just, it just hasn't happened. And the conditions with the drought, the fuels as dry as they are, the conditions they are, the buildup of the fuels, all these factors come into play that create an un unexpected situation. So what I've learned in my career is to expect the unexpected and prepare for it the best we can. And I would be prepared uh, in any community I am in the state of California. Uh, and we should, and we always preach this fire season, non-fire season, that uh, you be prepared for wildfire. And if the time is that your, th your community is threatened and you need to go, that you're ready to go and you go when you're, you're asked to go. So yeah, the question keeps coming up about aircraft and, and um, really what's been hindering us is a few things. One, you keep hearing about the drawdown of resources. So it's a finite resource, very limited. We do have some uh, that are assigned to this, uh, this incident and that we share with other incidents. Our air program, our air operations uh, directors are working diligently with their partners and the other fires, sharing that resource. So what little we have, we are sharing and, and we're utilizing when we can use it. The biggest factor has been the weather, in particular what the smoke has been doing, laying into most of the areas. So we can't fly the aircraft into these heavily smoked out areas. It's just not safe, and, it, and they've, quite frankly, they're not effective. So the areas that, that the air is clear and it's safe to do so, our uh, aerial supervision has uh, directed those aircraft into those areas. We've utilized them to the fullest extent that we can utilize them, and we've had some su success uh, utilizing those. But unfortunately, uh, a good portion of the fire has not been accessible for the aircraft to be utilized. So trust me, as much as we can use it, we're using it and um, we're using it to the maximum effect. But right now, just Mother Nature isn't uh, cooperating with us.
What have you got so far as aircraft that are that are actually working? Like what what went up today and, and dropped stuff? Uh, we've we've used we've had a, a a variety of our fixed wing air tankers uh, that we've utilized, um, and those again are shared aircraft. So we've had anywhere from uh, two to four tanker air tankers that have been able to drop on the uh, northern part of the fire in particular. Um, we've also have a number of uh, helicopters that we've got assigned to the uh, incident and that we've shared. So uh, anywhere from about four to six helicopters that we've been able to fly throughout the varying times of the day and just use them to their maximum effect based on their the fuel that they have available and, and the flight distances and all, all the little intricacies regarding aircraft. But uh, whatever we have, we've been flying them as much as we possibly can when we can. And those two to four drops were today? Uh, throughout the day, yeah. And well, the, those are the tankers, but they've done multiple drops um, throughout the day. Okay. And the helicopters also today? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Great. Specifically, where is the area of most concern right now? Where is the fire burning the brightest? What, what's the strategy for attacking it at that point? It might be you're going to repeat weather. Um, that's one. Is there a concern with natural gas lines? That's the second question. And then finally, you mentioned 1,100 firefighters. How many would you ideally have? Okay, so a lot, of, a, lot of question, a lot of parts of that question. So the, um, the areas of most concern and, and our priorities has been the, the Highway 9 corridor because of the population base um, and also upon, up on the ridge um, on uh, Empire Grade Road and the community of Bonny Dune. So those are the areas that the most population that have the direct effect of fire. Not that the outlying communities are not, but they're not currently immediately threatened. So we take the limited resource we have, we have divvied those out to those areas they're doing what we call point protection because that's all the, the, the strate uh, strategically and tactically that we can do to be effective with the limited resources. And that means that they're given a large area, they're very mobile, they do what's called bump and run tactics where they bounce from house to house, knock down fire, move fire around the house the best they can, bump onto the next one. Uh, normally if we have everything that we possibly could have as far as resources, we'd be able to be a little bit more static with that, put in a lot more control lines and so forth. Due to the uh, topography, the steepness of the, of the, um, the mountains and the, the heavy fuels, um, it's very difficult to do traditional uh, tactics where we can put in large uh, control lines, dozer lines, hand lines, and do that sort of operation. So um, because of that, we're, we're really having to change the way we, we do business and our strategy and our tactics. As far as the, uh, the gas lines and so forth, um, most of the homes here are propane and propane tanks and that sort of thing. Those are hazardous. and uh, as far as when the fire does impinge and impact those um, and, and they can explode and, and we have had that happen numerous times in areas that have been directly exposed to fire. So they are a, a hazard. We identify those hazards. We try to uh, protect against those, those tanks being imp impeded and infected by the, uh, by the fire and um, taking all those precautions. In regards to the amount of firefighters, ideally, if I could have 20,000 firefighters, I'd love to have them, but that's just not the reality. Typically on an event like this, we probably have, like I said, about 10 to 20 times the amount of, of, of the firefighters um, and the resources, uh, whether it be aerial resources, our hand crews, our, our engines, whatever, to, uh, to affect the, the uh, suppression of the fire. Thank you. Great. Everyone uh, up here is going to be available for questions uh, at the conclusion. I just want to end with a, a couple things. A couple questions have come up about what types of resources we do have on this fire. We have federal, state, and local government uh, all, all working together on this fire. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, very strong coordination with both San Mateo County Emergency uh, Operations Center as well as Santa Cruz County Emergency Operations Center. Obviously, when we evacuate people, there's a big coordination that goes on behind the scenes about where do they go, how do they get there, and how do their needs get met. So uh, although we stand up here, there is a large team of people uh, who actually make this uh, emergency uh, response possible. So on that note, uh, I'll, I'll end it here. We'll see you back here again tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. This concludes the uh, press conference. Thank you.